All right, so I'm in New York. I have to show you this horrible picture. Um, it's, it was a sad day. Um, in response to that war, we as a country spent $6 trillion, that's $6,000 billion, on a stupid war. Um, and that was because 3,000 people died. And meanwhile, we just heard this morning about the budget for the NIA. Uh, that's $3 billion a year. And uh, that's kind of in response to how many deaths per year from aging? Does anybody know? It's on the order, on the order of, of uh, 30 million. Okay, so that's a weird kind of ratio. If you divide it through, you get about $2 billion per person from 9-11 and uh, $100 per person uh, in terms of the federal government's prioritization of aging as a problem. Okay, so uh, last time I took a poll of the audience here at this, at this talk and uh, asked people a particular question and I uh, got a pretty interesting answer. Um, this time I'm, I'm uh, pretty focused on uh, encouraging more people to do tech startups. And so I'm wondering from you, uh, how many of you are presently uh, founders of an active uh, startup in the longevity biotech area? Yeah, okay, that's like 10%. Okay, how, how many, maybe even 15, how many would like to or think, are thinking of doing so? Nice, okay. Front row sitters, that's, that's also a pretty good sign. Okay, cool. All right, so I'm not talking to a completely cold room here. So um, last time I asked the question, who was here uh, because they're really behind the mission and who's here because they wanted to start companies uh, that make a lot of money, because uh, there's a lot of, obviously a lot of money and interest flowing into aging as, as a commercial area. And the answer was that almost everybody was primarily mission driven. Um, so, um, so I'm gonna talk about money. Um, uh, where is all the money? 10 years ago, these were the five most valuable companies in the entire world. And, you know, they're traditional corporations, uh, brick and mortar kind of thing. Uh, now, can, do you know what the most five valuable companies in the world are now? <laughs> Those guys. Um, yeah, all guys. Um, and they're venture-funded tech startups. Well, that's an interesting shift. Um, one thing that that's meant, meant is that there's been a wealth transfer from a particular class and type of people to a different class and type of people. Like tech startup people are, are kind of different from the old, the old boy, uh, like Exxon Mobil world. Um, which also means that a lot of their founders and early employees have gone on to further what they know, which is technology startups, and they've become angel investors and VCs. So there's a, a ton of money in that now, um, backed by people who are thinking in terms of the world as technology and things that you can change and you can make a huge difference that way. And gee, isn't biology kind of technology too? So that's the mindset now. My mindset is, uh, just, just to acknowledge my bias, I am, uh, just kind of part of startup as religion. Um, so the law of the instrument says that whatever your primary instrument of choice, you're gonna go through the world trying to apply that instrument to any problem that you find. Like if you're a, an electron microscopist, you're always looking around for things to put under your electron microscope and draw conclusions about it based on that. Um, or if it's a hammer, you're looking for nails. Uh, and in my case, it's startups. And so I'm always looking for things that problems that I can solve with a startup. And, uh, you know, not like how do people on college campuses find people to date, um, but uh, for instance, in the early 2000s uh, or the late 1999s, I uh, thought computers were too big and wanted to make them, I, I, th I really thought they ought to fit in your pocket based on all the components in there. So I founded a company and created the world's smallest computer. And um, we were, doing that for probably better part of, of um, 
nine years. I've uh, got in the Guinness Book of World Record. We had about 110 people in the company. And like, yeah, okay. I, in a way, solved that problem because it gave rise to these netbooks, which gave rise to the iPhone and, and Android, et cetera. Um, I won't take 100% responsibility, but I'll take 1%. Um, so our present problem, uh, the present nail that I would like to pound, uh, is uh, age-related diseases. And where does the money come from for that? Well, there are a bunch of different ways. Different people have different instruments. Some people, uh, what they know how to do is academic research. Um, other people um, work you know, in foundation labs or nonprofit labs um, or pharmaceutical companies. They have different money sources and they have different sort of cultures or orientations. I admit of my bias. Uh, I like using startups. Um, people uh, like to try stuff, um, try crazy stuff that shouldn't work, that only they know will work, and sometimes they're actually right. Um, and in some ways, I think that really fits the culture of this community as well. Uh, I think about, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but if there are anti-aging drugs about to be available to the public from any of these other sources, um, uh, are there any? Like, as far as I know, it's zero, but I, I don't have perfect knowledge. But I, I know of a number of tech startups, biotech startups, um, with molecules that are like heading toward uh, cl the clinic pretty, pretty uh, inexorably um, for various anti aging pathways. Um, so that, that makes me excited about this. But I'm like, it's ba basic confirmation bias for me. So. Along with this new influx of capital, there's also a new, um, sort of a new model for how to fund bio in the startup space. So back in 2005, it became less expensive to create a tech startup than it did, say, back in the 90s. You had to invest millions of dollars and buy tons of proprietary tools and assemble a huge team of people to do even the simplest of apps. Um, in the mid-2000s, there was enough open source software and stuff that you could glue together with APIs that for a few you know, tens of thousands of dollars, you could create a tech startup. Um, and Y Combinator was uh, one of the groups that helped kick that off and recognize that. And they, um, they were able to thus try a whole bunch of experiments uh, and you know, let people encourage these startups to try out their crazy ideas. Um, and some of those crazy ideas have turned into um, companies that a lot of you will recognize now, and over $100 billion worth of for uh, enterprise value. So that was 2005 through now. That process has been going. Um, and in that process, the, uh, the tech founders uh, didn't have to accept very much money, and they were sort of the masters of their startups. They didn't have to uh, yield control to their investors. And now we have uh, the people running those companies are still the founders, uh, which is a virtue to me. Uh, so in, in, this, in this new model, what we've noticed is that now it's a lot cheaper to form a biotech company. The tools have gotten cheaper. Now you can do uh, you know, exome sequencing for like a thousand times less than it would have cost you in the 90s or early 2000s. Um, like, Along, just go down the list of all the things you need to do. You can rent space. You can use these core facilities. You can um, rent lab space by the by the meter. Um, for a few hundred thousand dollars, you can get proof of concept um, in a number of different directions. And so that's given rise to that in combination with this influx of tech venture capital has given rise to a new model where in the old model, the, uh, the idea for the company would be dreamed up by VCs uh, and, and their friends in academia, and then they would um, get their leadership from the revolving door of their friends who had previously done the last molecule, um, and uh, they would make all the money from it, um, and then they'd, they'd go off and do it again. And now we have a new pattern where the founders, uh, often uh, postdocs or grad students, um, or people who are teamed up with them, decide we're going to do this. And they go, uh, um, we're going to run the company, and we're going to we're going to do we're going to partner with our our capital um, uh, sources, and they end up 
with significant fractions of ownership of the companies um, at the exits. Um, and um, also culturally, um, here there is more of an orientation around take this molecule, get it ready, sell it off to pharma, go back, start over again. And here I'm getting the feeling, it's too early to really tell, but I'm getting the feeling that people are, are more mission driven and building these companies to last. Like I'm going to solve diabetes and I'm gonna keep driving at this until it's gone or I'm gonna cure aging or I'm gonna cure this particular facet of aging. And I applaud that. I think they've become more powerful. And uh, Y Combinator now, is just, as just one example, I mention it because I'm a part-time partner there and I like their culture and I like to help them and I encourage people to run their startups uh, through that. And if you want to, my contact information is at the end and I can help you. Uh, there have been a number of um, notable companies that have recently come through there and a, and a bunch more in the pipeline. So in the world, there are about a million startups, roughly, plus or minus a few hundred thousand. And um, there's somebody running around at this conference with a beautiful, large Chromebook, um, about that big, um, showing this list that uh, he's compiled of uh, tech startups in the biospace. And it seems like there are about 70 that are pretty legit, um, that aren't just somebody talking about something they kind of want to do, um, or somebody trying to like hawk phenylalanine with a fancy name. Um, so uh, here are some criteria that I would look for if you uh, want to get your startup funded uh, or um, advised. Um, I like to help people start companies. Um, mostly, uh, you uh, also on the there's a panel here before, and, and um, like Kelsey Moody was sp specifically applauding people who are willing to do the hard work of actually cranking through all the ugly, boring operational aspects of getting a startup to really work in the biospace. Like all these checklist items of the toxicity and verification at various stages um, that your mechanism of action is really what you think it is um, and that all the many things that can go wrong aren't going wrong. Um, so a really practical idea with a clear path to that somebody would actually buy. Um, um, and also, uh, a number of people have come up to me and said, hey, I have the startup idea, and I'm like, that's basic research. Like, you should go do that at Harvard Medical School or something. Um, like, you have like five years of that to do before you're ready for someone to, to invest in you and say, yeah, make a startup out of that. Um, there sh it should be kind of about ready to go in some way. Like, you should be ready to test in animals, or you should be ready to run a big screening uh, effort uh, that you think has a high probability of making enough molecules for a pipeline. Um, strongly recommend that you have at least one co-founder. Uh, single founder startups often flounder. Like people tend to like, it's really, really, really hard and you're gonna hear uh, no many times from investors, uh, partners, um, employees that you want to hire and so on and it, it, it gets pretty tough after after a couple years and uh, if you have someone to bounce that back back on um, your chances of success are probably quadrupled at least uh, and specifically founders um, like a lot of people say yeah they really want to do a startup and oh they're doing these other two startups and they're working on this other project with this other person uh, and they're doing like a six-month project Oh, it's only like a quarter time because we want to make a really cool Burning Man sculpture and um, uh, it's brutal. So if you're going to do it, you, you really need to just do it um, and have 100% focus and not give up. Um, and that helps if you're mission driven um, as at least almost all of you were last year. Um, and also you end up having to deal with people like it, your startup is not, um, doesn't go anywhere if it's just you or a couple people. like. To, to really get something going, you want to get five people and then 10 people and then 50 people, 100 people and so on, all working on your project, um, then you'll really get something done. So um, these are just a list of people that I personally have relationships with or I've helped people get funded through um, VCs that are largely tech oriented in Silicon Valley that have started to fund bio stuff. Um, 
I, I think it's really great that they're, they're getting into this. And uh, some of them have already had multi-billion dollar exits in the space, and others of them, um, uh, at least in the, in the bio space, and others of them uh, will, I'm sure, in the not too distant future. And some of them are even funding longevity stuff. And there's also other funds outside Silicon Valley. Um, talk to me about those. Um, so what do you think is the main thing that's limiting us getting stuff done using my instrument of choice? We have, are there uh, like a, not good enough ideas to follow? Are there not enough founders? Is there not enough money? I heard people complaining like, God, if there was just more money, we could get more done around here. Um, what do you think it is? Yeah. You guys. Um, yeah, um, so basic research just doesn't really fit into the startup hammer very well. It just keeps falling off. Um, it kind of ends up being more philanthropic or, or, um, or governmental. Um, but if you figure out how to do startup research, uh, fundamental research inside the startup, uh, that would be great. I'd love to hear about it. But one exception to that I would mention might be Calico, uh, which is, you know, it's an alphabet company, so it's kind of a startup, and there's a lot of startup thinking from the, at least from the leaders, some of the leaders, um, main leader from Genentech, sort of not so much, um, but they do fund a lot of basic research. They've paid for a number of postdocs at UCSF and Buck Institute and elsewhere. Um, so founders is what we need. There's a lot of money running around. Um, there are a lot of ideas, like through this conference, um, you've seen many uh, like presentations where people describe all the science and all the reasons. And, say, and we, so we think these three molecules are probably uh, responsible for a big part of this aging process. And then we're pursuing this one or, and here's the paper we published, uh, end of talk. Uh, there's so many possible lines to pursue. There just aren't enough people to pursue them. I was part of creating a program called YC Bio, which is part of Y Combinator, which is this startup accelerator in San Francisco. And uh, the idea was that, wow, we're gonna fund all of the anti-aging startups out there, and we're gonna give them a million dollars a piece, and give them a year's worth of lab space, and we revved it up. And it just like, we're used to getting like, we get about you know 7,000 applications, and we choose maybe 100 companies in general for overall startup stuff. We just got so few applications for good aging biology companies. It was horrible. Um, and we ended up choosing a few, but, uh, you know, and, th and they're good, but um, a very small number, and it's just, it's not enough to run a program on. So what we need now is more people to get all fired up, um, figure out a really good idea, find your teammates, um, and there's plenty of ideas. What you can even do is find your co-founder first, decide you're gonna do this, and then go hang out in labs, go to Einstein, go to Stanford, uh, go to the Buck Institute and, and start talking to academics and figure out what your idea is. That, that is secondary. Um, and then go to any one of a gazillion people who will give you millions of dollars to pursue that idea. There is a shortage of founders. Um, so I would like to help you. It's kind of a religion for me. Um, you can reach me at either of these places. Viam is my day job right now. It's a startup company that I've been running since 2013. Uh, we're about 40 people. We automate animal research for drug discovery. We've done a ton of aging and lifespan studies um, and a lot of other stuff for about half of the top 10 pharma. Um, and Y Combinator where, is where I'm a part-time partner. And um, I don't know if I have any time for questions. Let me know if that's true or not.